morning, everybody. I'm Jacob Prollo. And I'm Kelsey Jackson. And we are the pastors here at Arise. Thank you for joining us at Pod Church this morning. Pod Church is how we are creatively continuing community during our latest safe at home order here in St. Louis County. And we're going to be gathering in small groups here at Arise, at host homes, and in our own homes. Now, watching Pod Church is a little different than normal church. So we have a few suggestions to make for you this morning. First, turn up the volume and sing along during worship. You're worshiping God, so don't worry about what your neighbors think of you. Sing with us. Second, pause the service if you need to. If something comes up that distracts you, hit pause. You need some more time to think or discuss the reflection questions during the message, hit pause and take that time to weigh in. Third, respond and connect. This isn't a movie or TV show. This is church online. So connect to community, text a friend, send an email, leave a comment online. React and respond and interact with others as much as you can, even if you're home alone. And finally, use your church at home guide. Uh, If you're an ariser, you should have gotten a church at home guide that was emailed to you this week, where you'll find reflection questions and resources, including, very importantly, links to kids curriculum and next steps so don't just watch service and go on with your day take a little bit of time at the end of service to reflect or do something practical from that guide now take just a moment and quiet your heart and join us in prayer as we get started this morning heavenly father we come before you apart but raising our voices as one church. God, we know that you are near. We thank you that you move in every situation. And God, in the strangest and most unsettling times, God, you are here and and we call on you to meet with us. We pray that your name would be glorified today. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray, Amen. amen. We are called to worship in every situation. We know that church online feels different. We know it's full of extra distractions, but we know that God can move in every situation and we will worship him with everything that we are. So please sing out with us today. You came. 
Good morning, Arise. Thank you so much for joining us for Pod Church this morning. We know life is weird right now, and it's just not the same watching church online as it is in person. But I want to thank you for serving and submitting with us during this season. And I want to encourage you to creatively continue community in whatever way you can in these next weeks and months. Whether that means joining us at Arise, potting with some friends, or simply watching online at home, let's continue to love God and love people together. We're going to get to this morning's message in just a moment, but first, take a look at this video clip. restoration. And many of us practice the art of restoring things. We have fixer-upper homes, project cars, maybe that random fairly heirloom or piece of furniture that we're working on. Whether it's people, homes, cars, artwork, or something else entirely, we love to see things restored. We love to see broken things fixed and returned to their former condition. There's just something beautiful about a restoration project. Maybe it's seeing something return to wholeness or seeing a wrong righted that gives us pause. Maybe the restored item helps us remember, uh, you know, days gone by and reminisce. Or maybe there's a small part of us that's awakened by the restoration of an item. Something that reminds us that one day everything that's broken is going to be restored. We're talking about restoration this morning because that's the final chapter in God's story. This is what we've been talking about the last several weeks here at Arise, the grand overarching story that the Bible tells about how God is working in history for the salvation of the world. And so far in God's story, we've walked through creation, fall, waiting, redemption, and the already and not yet. We've seen that God's story goes something like this, that in the beginning, God created the universe, but humanity brought distortion and death into creation. So God chose a people who he shaped through time and circumstance. And when the time was right, he sent his son Jesus to live, die, and rise from the dead. To continue his work, God gave the church the mission of proclaiming Jesus as king. This is where we ended up last week in the tension of what we call the already and the not yet, where Jesus is reigning as king, but his kingdom has not yet come in its fullness. And this, we said, was our part of the story. This is where we are right now, waiting on King Jesus to come again 
and bring about the full and final restoration of creation. To borrow a phrase from one of the best stories of all time, right now we're waiting on the return of the king. Now, while most of the New Testament, most of the second part of the Bible tells us about the life of Jesus and the practicalities of doing life in the church, there are several passages in the New Testament that talk about the return of the king. Perhaps no part of scripture is more important for this part of the story than Revelation, the last book of the Bible. But before we look at Revelation, which we'll get to in a minute, take just a moment now to reflect on or discuss what you have heard about the return of the king and revelation. Now there are a couple of key things to know about the return of the king in the book of Revelation. First, scripture does not give us a specific time for Jesus' return. In fact, Jesus is pretty adamant that no one knows when he's going to return. Stay awake, he says, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. No one knows when the king will return, and anyone who tells you otherwise is selling you something and is not to be trusted. Second, there are just not a bunch of overly specific events leading up to the return of the king. It's common practice today for people to claim certain geopolitical events or maybe sequences of events as precursors to the return of Jesus. But scripture doesn't outline a specific series of events. There are going to be troubles before Jesus comes back, sure. But when the writers of the New Testament talk about the return of the king, they're mostly interested in making sure that you and I are prepared for the end. In Luke, for instance, we hear, You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Likewise, the Apostle Paul writes, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. So be ready, the New Testament says, but don't go looking to predict the end. And finally, know that interpretations of Revelation are highly, highly contested. For thousands of years, Christians have discussed and debated the meaning of eschatological passages, that is, passages about the end of the story, like those we find in Revelation. And Christians have come to sometimes wildly different conclusions about what those passages may or may not mean. In our mere Christian approach here to rise, we don't adopt a specific view of end times other than to say that King Jesus, he's going to come again. But if you want to learn more about eschatological views, there are some awesome resources out there. Resources like Stephen Gregg's Revelation, Four Views, which are great places to start. So whatever the manner of things prior to the return of the king, the story of Christianity says that one day, one day he's going to return. And that return is going to do some very, very important things, including bringing about the full and final restoration of creation. So the last chapters of the Bible, they paint a picture of what this is going to look like. In Revelation chapters 20 to 22, John records his vision of the beautiful end of God's story. And if you want to pause the service right now and read all of Revelation 20 through 22, feel free to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to hit some highlights here beginning in Revelation 20 verse 11. John says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades, gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. 
If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of, from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light all the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more, and they will have no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is it. This is the restoration of creation and the arrival of God's kingdom in its fullness. Jesus returns, the dead are resurrected, judgment day occurs, and all things are made new. Now, there is obviously a lot going on in these chapters. There's a lot going on in the passage I just read. There's even more going on in the chapters as a whole. So I want us to consider some story highlights from this part of God's story. But before we get to those, take a minute to reflect or discuss what stands out to you from this passage about the return of the king. All right, let's look at some of the many story highlights from this scene in Revelation. What do we see happening in this chapter of God's story? Well, first, the end begins when Jesus returns. When Jesus returns to earth, the, the tension of the already and the not yet, it ends. It's finished. And the conclusion of God's story begins. Everything else about the end of the story follows from the sudden arrival of the king. Second, the arrival of the king marks the end of Satan, sin, and death. When Jesus returns, he's going to completely defeat any force or entity opposed to God. This includes, as Revelation 20.14 tells us, death itself, which will be ended forever. This is literally the death of death. Third, the dead will rise. This is what's known as the general resurrection. Everyone who has lived and died will be raised from the dead for judgment. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to what they had done. Judgment day comes for everyone in the end, whether they follow Jesus or not. Fourth, creation will be restored. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, 
John records. The old is done away with. The brokenness and the distortion of the fall, they're eradicated forever. And John goes on to say that God now lives and reigns with his people. I love this passage. He says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. All of the sickness, all of the sin, all of the suffering that surrounds us, it's going to be gone forever. Not just out of sight, not just out of mind, restored. The language of this section is telling us that the restoration of creation is going to be comprehensive. The whole of human life in the context of the whole of creation is going to be restored. Look at verse 5. Behold, Jesus says, I am making all things new. Not, not, he does not say, I make all new things. He says, I make all things new. All of those bent and broken things around us, all of those relationships in our lives that have been distorted by sinfulness and selfishness, all the good things in the world that have been damaged and destroyed by evil, God is going to make them new. He's going to restore them. Now, for the past several months, I've been having some fairly significant back problems. And when things have been bad and someone has, you know, asked me how I'm doing or what they can do to help, I'll, I'll often joke, well, you know, a new back would be nice. But here at the end, Jesus isn't giving me a new back. He's going to restore this one to wholeness. He's going to make this one new. And he's going to do the same thing with every part of who we are that's been corrupted by the fall. Every physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual wound that we carry is going to be healed. Behold, I am making all things new. And finally, we see that King Jesus is going to reign forever. No longer will there be anything accursed, and the night will be no more. They will need no lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The king reigns. He reigns with us, and his reign is good, and his reign has no end. And notice where this rain takes place. I think this is one of the coolest things in all of Scripture. The rain, Jesus' rain takes place beside a river of water of life and beside the tree of life. King Jesus reigns in a city, yes, but he reigns in a garden. Remember all the way back to the beginning of God's story with creation, where the story begins. Where did we start? With a garden where God walked with Adam and Eve. And here at the end, what do we have? A restored garden where God reigns with Adam and Eve and all of their descendants. Guys, the creation that was broken will be restored. It will be restored to its original state and everything will be renewed. This is the end. This is how God's story ends. In the beginning, God created the universe, but humanity brought distortion and death into creation. So God chose a people who he shaped through time and circumstance, and when the time was right, he sent his son Jesus to live and die and rise from the dead. To continue his work, God gave the church the mission of proclaiming Jesus as king until he comes again in glory to fully restore creation. This is how things will end at the end of all things. Take a moment now to reflect or discuss what part of the restoration of creation are you looking the most forward to? The Christian life is built upon God's story, on the realities of the creation, fall, 
waiting, redemption, the already and not yet, and very importantly, restoration. Embrace that story and live it out. Even when things seem bad, God's story reminds us that the end is not yet here. And it reminds us that even when the end does come, we can hope. Christian hope is founded on the promise of God that one day Jesus is going to return and he's going to restore all things. This is the hope that sustains us when things are difficult. And it's the hope that enables us to live a life filled with the Spirit, to restore the broken relationships in our lives, and to do work in our pockets of the kingdom today. Do you have that hope? Do you have Christian hope? The confident expectation that King Jesus reigns and one day he's going to come back and he's going to make all things new. If you don't, let me challenge you to pledge your allegiance to Jesus today. To follow him and to live in the hope of his story. Don't give up. Don't try to make it through life on your own. Keep looking forward to the return of the King and the restoration of all things. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your story, for the whole story that Scripture tells us, from creation to the fall to waiting to the good news of redemption because of your Son, Jesus, to life around us now and the already and not yet, and to the hope of full and final restoration in the future. Father, there's so much around us today and in our world that can distract us from your message and your news. The good news that your son Jesus is the saving king and that you have not abandoned us to our brokenness and sinfulness, but you've come to save us. You've come to give us life and give it to us abundantly and that someday you're going to come and you're going to fix everything that is broken and wrong with our world. Father, we wait eagerly for that moment. Give us peace and hope as we wait. Give us work to do and strength to do what you've called us to do. And Father, most of all, give us hope. Give us hope that even when we live in a crazy, insane world that forces us to watch church in pods or online and the things are just not normal, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. That this is not the end. That things won't always be this way and that it's okay to not know what's going to happen because we know what happens in the end. We know that in the end you win. Thank you for your victory, King Jesus. Amen. Right now, I want to challenge you to respond to what you've seen or heard and experienced this morning. Whatever God is impressing on your heart or mind, do something about it. Don't just watch church this morning. Respond to God's call in your life. Prepare yourself for the end. Live in the hope of the restoration of all things. Follow King Jesus. Respond right now and then let us know so that we can walk beside you on your journey. There are a few ways you can do this. You can fill out our online connect card at arisestl.com slash new. And there you can include any next steps that you'd like to take or any questions that you may have. You can text the pastor at 636-429-2901 where I would love to chat with you or connect with you this week. Or you can submit a prayer request. Let our prayer team know how we can be praying for you this week by submitting a request at arisestl.com slash prayer. Whatever and however you respond, take a moment right now to do that, pausing the service if you need to. Another way you can respond is by continuing to support Arise financially through your offerings. Now, if you're joining us today and you're not a regular part of the Arise family, do not feel any obligation to give. This service is our gift to you. We are just so thankful that you can join us. But if Arise is your church home, even if it's your new church home, I want to encourage you to support the work that God is doing in and through our church. 
There are three ways you can give. You can give online via our website, arisestl.com slash give. You can also set up a recurring gift there. You can drop off a donation at Arise Monday through Thursdays between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Or you can mail your gift to us. Our address is 639 Gravway Bluffs Boulevard, Suite I, Fenton, Missouri, 63026. Again, take a moment right now to respond to God's call in your life. And then join us as we worship and we praise our great restorative God. Thank you.
Hey guys, thanks again for joining us this morning. Let me encourage you to reach out and connect today. We're not meant to go through life alone, particularly when things are hard and weird like they are right now. So let us know that you participated in worship today by filling out the connect card at arisestl.com slash new. And if you're interested in joining us here at Arise on a Sunday morning or connecting to a pod next week, you can learn all about that at arisestl.com slash pod. If you are watching from a pod this morning, let me encourage you to spend a few minutes right now talking through the discussion questions in your church at home guide. And if you have any questions or concerns about anything, feel free to contact us at office at arisestl.com. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and I hope that you can join us this coming Sunday for church as we kick off our series, Messiah, as we prepare for the birth of Jesus this Christmas.